Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, look, somebody's here, Fazima from Islamabad. Uh, Professor Fazana, uh, Dr. Hina Saliki, and some 70 people already online. And this happens to be Friday prayer time. So I'm sure that uh, in a few minutes, we will have more people coming in. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, sir. Fazima, you want to start? Yes, sir, sure. So should I start? Yes, please. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hazima Mozam and I welcome you to the first lecture of Formstick Entity Network joint lecture series. Um, NDT Network, which is Neglected Tropical Disease Network, is funded by UKRI's Global Challenges Research Fund. So I'm sorry, I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so should I con Yeah, please. So should I continue? Sure. Please. Okay. Um, so, NDT Network uh, is funded by UKRI's Global Challenges Research Fund, which is a consortium of academic researchers from South America, Asia, and UK, seeking new therapeutic solutions to leishmaniasis and other tropical diseases. The purpose of holding uh, these joint lecture series is to promote global health, um, a global scientific cooperation, and build research capacity to find new and better therapeutic solutions for entities. And with this, we are very delighted and honored to have Professor Dr. Jami Motram with us. Professor Dr. Jami is Professor of Pathogen Biology, York Biomedical Research Institute, University of York, UK. And to introduce him briefly, he is the Fellow of Royal Society of Edinburgh and Fellow of Royal Society of Biology. And with this, I would request Professor Dr. Iqbal Jodri, Coordinator General of Comstech and Director of ICCBS to welcome and introduce our guest speaker for today. Good morning uh, and uh, good afternoon because we are in different time zone. Uh, my dear friend, Professor Jeremy Motram, uh, dear distinguished colleagues from some 20 different countries and we have registration of over 200 people uh, from OIC region. Jeremy, OIC region is the second largest uh, uh, political alliance after United Nations with 57 member states uh, located in four continents. So from South America to Africa, Europe, and Asia, there are 57 member states. And uh, uh, the uh, responsibility of Comstech, which is Ministerial Standing Committee for Science and Technology, is to promote science and technology cooperation uh, between the OIC member states and beyond. And this is exactly what we intend to do because uh, being part of the NTD network, we have uh, benefited from uh, the wonderful uh, resources and, uh, and capacity which we have uh, in the network. And we thought the benefit of this network should really uh, expand far and wide because these 57 member states, half of them are unfortunately least developed countries in Africa. So from tropical Africa to tropical, tropical South Asia, we have uh, so many countries infected uh, with tropical diseases and there is a wide interest of understanding how uh, we can work together to find uh, cure of them at, at least, uh, and, uh, and to, to develop some good science in it. With this, I would like to uh, introduce someone I really always cherish and appreciate of his professionalism and his capacity, uh, his global uh, outlook and his uh, willingness to help other in all regions. He has been very active in uh, Middle East and in South America. Jeremy undertook PhD studies at the University of Glasgow, focused on metabolism of Leishmania glycosol. He carried out postdoctoral work at the University of California, San Francisco, in molecular parasitology with a focus on gene expression and RNA splicing in African trypsonomas. Uh, he returned to Glasgow for further postdoctoral work 
on mitochondrial uh, tRNA import on newly formed welcome unit of uh, molecular parasitology before developing an independent molecular parasitology research program using molecular and cellular approaches to understand regulation of trypsinomatid uh, life cycle. He was an MRC a senior research fellow uh, between 1993 to 2003 before being appointed professor of molecular and cellular parasitology in 2000. He joined the Department of Biology at the University of York in 2016. We have had the honor of visiting his laboratory. Uh, he's working right at the frontier. Someone of his caliber is, uh, is, a, is a blessing for the network and for all the scientific community. His research interest in exploiting uh, peptidases, epige epigenetic regulators, and protein kinases as drug targets. Jeremy is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh and fellow of the Royal Society of Biology and was a, a pesquisador, a visitant, a special, some Spanish name, at the University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Um, I, we have had a, a long affiliation, about three years, and I must say that I was always extremely impressed from his level of understanding and his willingness to help. So with this, I would like to invite uh, our dear friend, Professor Jeremy Mottram, for his lecture. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a, a lovely introduction. And it's an absolute pleasure to be able to present some of the work that we're doing within our NTD network, our global network for neglected tropical diseases, and to, to have this opportunity to tell some of the CONSTEC members about uh, the work that we do and, and hopefully to promote further interactions in the future. So I'll just um, share my screen. Um, I hope you'll be able to, um, to see the screen. Yes. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is around some of the, the, the ways in which technology um, and particularly in terms of genetic manipulation of, of parasites is helping us think about new ways of developing therapeutics. But before I, I go into some of the, the details, I'd just like to say a few words about the network so that the, the CONSTEC uh, members can understand a little bit about what we're trying to do. Um, as this is the first of the of the seminar series between our between the networks. So, um, as has already been introduced, this is a, a network um, based in the UK, actually at the University of Durham, um, that links um, researchers interested in neglected tropical diseases with 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 four hubs: one in the UK, in Pakistan, in India and then a hub in South America. And so these four regional hubs allow a number of research institutes and research groups to come together to address some of the fundamental questions around early phase drug discovery. And so we have a mixture of parasitologists, chemical biologists, structural biologists, and some immunologists that are taking an interdisciplinary approach and a collaborative approach to seek new solutions for niche analysis. Um, and this is in the first phase of this project. And in the first phase, what we're trying to do is to identify molecular targets within the parasite that can be used for identifying new chemical entities that can be the first phase of a drug discovery program. And I, and I think we're very happy with the way that this network has established over the last few years, very collaborative between our groups and some really exciting science starting to develop. And as part of this is, is, is a, a fundamental wish to train early career researchers in the field. Um, and to do that, we have a number of training workshops um, held around the world in order to introduce new technologies. We have secondments between network labs and travel bursaries for students and postdocs to um, 
either have exchange visits or to, to attend conferences. And this has led to a number of outputs um, that we're very pleased with. And for more information, if anybody's interested, um, please go and have a look at the, the website that explains what, what we're doing. So as part of that network, uh, I'll just say a couple of words about where I come from, which is the University of York. And for, for those of you who are not familiar, this is, uh, York is located in the north of England. It's a, it's a city of around 200,000 people, so rather a small city, but an ancient city. So um, with Roman, Viking and, and, and a variety of other um, activities gone over the millennia. Um, and for the last 20 years, we've um, sort of established a research program on leash monastics at the University of York that we, that we know, now call Leash at York. Um, and we have a website that actually outlines how we're leading um, or plan to lead research in leash monastics um, in the future. And um, the fundamentals of what we're interested in is discovery bioscience on the way in which the parasite interacts with its host in order to then be a, to allow us to um, undertake drug discovery programs and vaccine discovery programs. And that's within the context of a broader interest in biomedical research that we carry out in York. And so what I'd like to do today is to talk about some of the discovery science that we're doing, um, drug discovery. So I'm sure most of you will be familiar um, with the range of diseases that occurs with infection with the leishmania parasite to cause human leishmaniasis with, with a variety of outcomes, including visceral leishmaniasis, post calazar dermal leishmaniasis, cutaneous and mucocutaneous. And not only are there different uh, ways in which the disease manifests itself in humans and the outcome of that disease from severe chronic infection and death from visceral to self-cure, for example, in cutaneous, but the different parasites um, that cause these infections can lead to these different outcomes. So for example, Leishmania donovani is associated generally with visceral leishmaniasis, and for example, leishmania mexicana with cutaneous leishmaniasis. Now, the work that I do in the laboratory is primarily using the leishmania mexicana as the model organism, but I think many of the, the ways in which I'm gonna describe the research is, is equally applicable to different species. So the status of endemicity, of course, um, is in tropical and subtropical areas for leishmaniasis and for VL, um, primarily in the Indian subcontinent, East Africa and South America. Um, I don't have the slide for cutaneous leishmaniasis, but that spreads through the Middle East, North Africa, et cetera, as well. So we know that current drugs um, are still an issue um, because of the variable efficacy of these drugs and, and the serious toxicity and side effects that the drugs have. And people will be familiar with the use of antimonials, um, still widely used through the world for treating uh, both visceral and cutaneous leishmaniasis. Liposomal antitericin B, um, probably one of the best drugs that we have, but has a number of toxicities um, and, of course, painful for IV infusion. And the only um, oral drug being available has been nortefacin. Um, but there are issues in terms of toxicity with nortefacin and also with, in terms of variable efficacy. So, for example, only 60 to 80 percent effective in East Africa. So there's a new need for, for drugs. And actually in, in the last five to 10 years, there's been a major push on 
um, developing new drugs for visceral leishmaniasis. And, and I took this slide off the, uh, the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative website that explains the portfolio in research and development for DNDI from discovery through translation, development and implementation. And for leishmaniasis, I think what's interesting is that there's a whole series of research going on now at every phase of the development process. And most exciting is the number of new chemical entities that have entered phase one clinical trials for um, visceral leishmaniasis. Um, and these drugs are being studied not only for, sing, uh, for their effectiveness, but also in future for the possibility of using in combination um, to prevent future drug resistance. So there's a, there's a rich pipeline of compounds that are now in clinical trials um, and a number being built up from um, earlier phase drug discovery. Yet whilst we have this wonderful portfolio of drugs, um, potential drugs in the pipeline, there's always the risk that these will fail during the translation pipeline. And therefore we need to continue to think about how discovery science can continue to feed this pipeline um, for future development. So the future needs really are um, well validated, and that's either genetically or chemically validated targets. Um, and, and, and by targets, I mean those proteins or enzymes within the parasite that are unique to the parasite or have differences from the host and that we can then use to look for new chemical entities that can be developed um, into those future drugs. So, so it's quite interesting around the timeline for, for leishmaniasis drug discovery. So what I sort of put here is from the very earliest phases of, of the identification of leishmania gonorrhoni causing visceral leishmaniasis, in the early 1900s, over 100 years ago, the first treatment for antimonials was um, in 1913. And these, these antimonials were improved through the generation of pentavalent antimonials in the 1920s, but are still being used today. Um, Ambazone, for example, got FDA approval in 1997, and Miltefacin licensed in 2020. So whilst we have this pipeline of drugs, there have actually been no new registered drugs for leishmaniasis in the last 20 years. And it'll probably be um, a number of years before any of those new chemical entities can reach uh, patients. So in, in, in terms of the development of the, the drugs, we can also look at some of the key points in this time frame or timeline um, for the parasite itself. So for example, the sandfly vector identified, transmission from sandfly to human and understanding transmission dynamics and, and the life cycle of the parasite was elucidated over 50 years ago. Um, an important part of this was try to understand Leishmania taxonomy in the context of different parasites causing different um, diseases. And in the 1980s, there was the use of Leishmania major to determine um, the Th1, Th2 paradigm in terms of the new response to pathogens. Um, and, and relevant to this particular talk was the 1990s, where the first gene knockout for Leishmania was performed, um, actually by Angela Cruz and Steve Beverly's lab. Um, and Angela is part of our NTD network. Um, and since then, genome, uh, Leishmania genome in 2005. And I think one of the major ways in which understanding of parasite and its interaction with the host is, is going to change is through the um, ability of CRISPR to edit genomes of parasites, either, for example, to understand the basic biology, but also to, for example, make uh, attenuated live vaccines and those type of experiments are ongoing at the moment. So our interest um, 
in the lab is really around the parasite that causes leishmaniasis. Um, and we're interested in the way in which the parasite goes from its transitions through its life cycle from procyclic promastigote to the infectious metacyclic form that's found in the mouth parts of the sandfly. And then as the parasite is taken up by macrophages, it develops into these ovoid amastigote forms that actually replicate and cause disease such that you have proliferative and non-proliferative populations um, that develop within the malarian host and cause disease. So our interest um, in the lab is twofold. One, to understand the molecular mechanisms by which this transition occurs for the parasite, but also what is it about the uh, biology of the parasite in the host that allows us to be able to identify new drug targets. And as I said before, we work with the Leishmania mexicana parasite. So the way we're looking at this um, in terms of drug discovery is twofold. One in terms of phenotypic drug discovery, where you screen um, libraries of chemical compounds against the parasite to look for parasite cell death, and then afterwards identify the target. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and there are some examples um, where um, companies like Novartis have identified a number of series of compounds that inhibit particular molecules within the parasite. Um, and these have been identified targets through this phenotypic screening approach. The second approach that I'll talk about first is on target-based, where we can identify targets and then validate those targets through either genetic or chemical means um, in order to then develop um, assays to do target-based screening to get new chemical compounds. And there are a variety of targets that we're working on, and I'm going to focus primarily on the protein kinases. So one of the interesting things about genetic modification in Leishmania is that um, since that initial first gene knockout in Leishmania in 1990, uh, the approach that's been taken is to do two rounds of genetic modification with a drug selectable marker to allow homologous recombination to either generate a knockout mutant where the drug resistance marker replaces the gene of interest um, and those gene, gene knockouts, or where that's not possible, but we get drug resistance integration but still retain a copy of the gene. And this has generally been used as a, as a very simple way of identifying whether a gene is essential or not. Uh, so if you can generate a null mutant, then it's not essential, but if you cannot, then it is likely to be essential. And there are other genetic ways that we can test that. So between 1990 and 2018, um, which was when this study was done, there were only 200 genes that had been characterized within Leishmania um, for testing whether they were essential or non-essential. So, I mean, that is a remarkably small, around, small amount of the 8,000 genes that are found in the parasite. But that's changing since 2018, and it's changing because of this approach, which is CRISPR gene editing. And I'll just explain very briefly how we're using gene knock, uh, CRISPR editing to do gene knockouts and epitope tagging. So broadly, what happens is the parasite um, expresses the Cas9 nuclease, um, and then inserted into the parasite are some guide RNAs that bind to the target gene of interest. Um, and then the Cas9 uses that specific interaction between the guide RNA and the DNA in order to cause a double-stranded break. And that double-stranded break could occur at once in the genome, or if you have two different guides, you could target on both sides of an open reading frame. Then if you provide a repair template, often containing a drug resistance marker, homologous recombination will allow that to be repaired and your open reading frame will be replaced by the drug resistance marker 
and one can end up with a gene deletion mutant. The other approach we take is to epitope tag. So in the same way, the Cas9 is expressed in a parasite, you get a cleavage directed by a guide RNA, and then you can integrate and provide a repair cassette that contains an epitope. So for example, what we've used is this fluorescent protein, M neon green, that then integrates into the N terminus of the open eating frame, causing a fusion protein of the M neon green, M neon green, and your gene of interest. So the target class that I'll describe this work for is involved in post-translation modifications. And we're particularly interested in those post-translation modifications that our key components are cell signaling pathways that regulate the cell cycle of the parasite and differentiation, because we think these are good drug targets. And so we're interested in phosphorylation. Um, so that's the addition of phosphate groups onto serine three and amino tyrosine residues. We're interested in ubiquitination, the adding of ubiquitin onto lysine residues of target proteins. And we're also interested in proteolysis. But I'm going to focus on phosphorylation for the talk. And the reason we're interested in phosphorylation is because it's involved in many signaling cell signaling pathways. Many of those cell signaling pathways are essential for parasite replication in the host. We know that there's extensive phosphorylation occurring in leishmania, so we can detect proteins that are phosphorylated. This class of enzyme is very well studied, so we know, for example, a lot about protein kinase enzyme function, and it's an important class of drug targets. So Gleevec, of course, was the first protein kinase inhibitor that was developed that's been used to treat leukemia, but also now one of the um, inhibitors that's in phase one clinical trial is an inhibitor of a protein kinase, CRK12, that's been developed um, by uh, GSK and the University of Dundee. So the human and ki leishmania kinomes differ quite significantly. So in, in humans, there are over 500 protein kinases and leishmania um, just over 200. Um, but broadly, the, the classification of protein kinases is, is broadly similar. So, for example, in humans, there's a CMGC family, and there's also in leishmania. Um, and these contain um, enzymes such as suckling-dependent kinases. Um, but one of the big differences is that leishmania lacks tyrosine kinases. So, for example, Gleevec uh, wouldn't have a target within... Uh, Leishmania, um, and there are a number of other changes within the kinome. So what we've been doing is using the CRISPR um, approach to do two things, to target the deletion of every gene within the kinome of Leishmania in order to test to see whether it's essential or not, and also to find out the function of that kinase in the life cycle of the parasite. And the second thing we've done is to use the endogenous tagging approach to make an M neon green fusion with every Leishmania gene so that we can make um, M neon green open reading frame protein kinase fusions to look at the protein expression in the parasite. So we've done that experiment. Um, and each of these red dots defines a protein kinase that's essential. And so there are 44 kinases where we could not identify a gene deletion mutant, and 162 where we generated a knockout mutant. And there's a whole series of potential drug targets within this list of essential kinases. Um, and I'll talk about a few of those in a minute. So we've also then validated the gene deletions, either through gene sequencing. So here, for example, we can show that there are, that there's zero coverage of the gene of interest in our gene deletion mutants, and also using um, polymerase chain reaction to um, identify the absence of a wild type gene in the knockout mutant. In terms of our genome and kinome-wide tagging, 
we've been able to identify the location of all of the protein kinases, um, apart from one, by doing fluorescent microscopy of amnion green fluorescent proteins within the parasite. And what you can see here are a number of examples of parasites that have, for example, a lysosomal location or a location on the subpollicular membrane or in the mitochondria. And here's a table of all of the different locations that we use to identify the protein um, based on this cellular landmarks initially. So the other thing we did was then to try and phenotype the non-essential Leishmania kinomes. The idea here being that we wanted to know where the kinase um, is essential for progression through the life cycle. So all of the protein kinases that were uh, generated by CRISPR incorporated a barcode, and that barcode allowed us then to carry out this barseq approach to look at um, the, the protein kinase function. So the 159 protein kinase knockout gene deletion mutants were put into a single pool, and then were assessed for their ability to develop as pro-mastogotes or amastogotes, either um, azenic in macrophages or the mouse or the sandfly. And the way this works is that we um, do PCR and gene sequencing to identify the percentage representation of individual mutants within the whole population of cells. And so for example, here in this particular protein kinase, it represents about one two hundredth of the total population. Um, and then as we go through the various phases of the differentiation process, this changes. So this particular kinase is increases in um, representation and therefore increases in the population. Whereas this particular kinase disappears, um, and that's because the parasite cannot survive within the mouse. And so we've been able to look at all of the protein kinases and identify where they're required for life cycle progression. And in fact, we've been able to use a, a projection pursuit cluster analysis to be able to look at those families of protein kinases that have similar phenotypes. So for example, in cluster one, all of these protein kinase genes here have an increase in fitness during that life cycle progression. Whereas in cluster six, these protein kinases have a, a gradual loss of fitness. Um, and, and cluster five in particular, these parasites are unable, the mutants are unable to survive within the mass. And again, this provides a list of potential kinases um, for drug target evaluation. And so what this does is gives us a huge data set for hypothesis generation. You know, why are these protein kinases required for the life cycle trans transition? And why are they essential for the parasites? And are they drug targets? And you can read more about this in a paper that we published uh, quite recently. So the second thing I just, or the final thing I want to talk about is precision editing. Um, and for this, what we do is, is try and make single nucleotide changes within the genome of the parasite by targeting a particular gene of interest. And this is very similar to the way in which I've described before, in that we have expressed the CAS9, and then we provide a repair template that is an oligonucleotide encoding a mutation within um, the oligonucleotide. And what that does is cause a rearrangement of the gene of interest with the sequence encoded by that oligonucleotide to introduce a point mutation or several point mutations within the gene. And, and this works quite well. We get about 15% of our transfections that have this type of mutation. And we've used that in order to generate mutations. So just so we've used that to um, make an approach for 
chemical and genetic target validation using what's called the bump and hold strategy, where we introduce a mutation into the gatekeeper residue in the active site of a compound uh, of, a, of a kinase that allows us to generate a bumped kinase inhibitor that will only inhibit the protein kinase where this mutation has occurred. And so in a variety of these protein kinases that we're interested in, there's in the thionine residue. And if we mutate the thionine residue to glycine or alanine, that then makes those kinases susceptible to this particular inhibitor, whereas the wild type kinase is not susceptible because it can't enter that hydrophobic pocket. So we've used this CRISPR editing to generate those mutations. And I'll give one example or two examples. So this is the KKT2 protein kinase, which is a kinase found in the Kinita core of the leishmania, which is an essential complex required for cell division. And if we introduce that single mutation of the methionine, um, the codon encoding methionine to alanine, that makes the um, parasites susceptible to the 1MPP1 um, inhibitor. So this is the growth curve percentage survival for the wild type. And then if you, if you do the same on the mutant, you see that it's about 100 fold more sensitive to the inhibitor after the introduction of that single mutation. So this works very nicely for KKT2, and also for other protein kinases such as CNGC or CRK9, uh, but not every kinase that we work on. So we can then use that to look at inhibition of the protein kinase function and look, for example, for cell cycle arrest. So if we inhibit KKT2 with this compound on, on this particular mutant, then we see a buildup in S phase um, of the uh, parasites. Whereas for CMGC, if we look at the, at the fax plot of parasites inhibited by the compound, we see an increase in cells that are in the G2M phase of the cell cycle. And then we can map that back into the way in which the parasite transmits, transitions through the life cycle in order to look whereabouts the parasite is inhibited. And to do that, we use fluorescence microscopy. So we can track the different stages of the life cycle of the parasite by using this antibody that binds to tubulin. And that allows us then to define whereabouts the parasite is in the different cell cycle. And in fact, that led us to this um, finding that KKT2 is required both for transition through S phase, but also entry into G2. And for this particular kinase, CMGC, it allows us to identify that the kinase is essential for transitioning through this part of the cell cycle. And this provides an explanation about why these kinases are essential, because they're required for cell cycle progression but also it, it provides hope that we'll be able to develop other inhibitors uh, for um, development of new. And finally, I'll just talk uh, very briefly about some of the approaches we're taking for phenotypic drug discovery. And this came through a project where we were working with Novartis to screen for inhibitors against Trypanosoma brucei and leishmania. And we identified this compound, AB1, that has potent activity against the parasites, so this leishmania donovani with an EC50 of around 500 nanomolar in uh, amastigotes and macrophages. And this compound um, is an inhibitor of human EGF, EGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors. But as I said before, leishmania doesn't have kinase tyrosine kinases and therefore it must have a different target. And in fact, we identified this kinase here, CLK1, as the target for this compound. And we got a crystal structure where we can see the compound bound into the active site and binding this cysteine residue, C215. And if we mutate that residue in trypanosomes, 
C215, then we show resistance to the complex. So the binding, the covalent binding to the cysteine is essential for the mode of action of the AB1 compound. So we're interested in this particular compound because it's a component of the trypanosome kinetochore, which is a, is a, a structure that allows segregation of chromosomes. Um, and it's essential for the parasites and therefore it's interesting as a drug target. So we wanted to know whether in Leishmania, CLK1 is also essential and inhibited by this compound. We knew that it happened in, uh, in, in trypanosomes, but we didn't know about Leishmania. Um, so what we did again was to use CRISPR to carry out a mutation of the cysteine residue in the homologous position in CLK1 and also in CLK2, another protein kinase with a similar active site such that we mutated the cysteine to an alanine in this position. And what we found was that if we did that, then we uh, reduced the potency of the AB1 compound by more than 200 fold. So what this shows is that um, Leishmania, CLK1 is inhibited by AB1, and there's a potential new class of anti Leishmania compounds that we can develop for the future. The other interesting thing that we found was that if we use AB1, we get a cell cycle arrest in, in mitosis or early cytokinesis. And in fact, that allows us then to map the position of the CLK1 protein kinase in terms of its essentiality for this part of the cell cycle. So I'd just like to finish by thinking a little bit about what next with Leishmania gene knockout using CRISPR. I said previously that we probably knocked out um, 200 genes using classical methods over 20 years. Um, but in the last two years, there's probably been over 1,000 gene deletion mutants generated using CRISPR. And that's just between my lab and Eva Glunz's lab in Glasgow, who developed the CRISPR technology. And so we now have this new project going forward. It's called LeashGem. We have a, a website about it. It's been funded by the Wellcome Trust to define the molecular determinants required for Leishmania life cycle progression and virulence. And so what we're doing now is we're going to target for gene deletion all 8,500 genes in Leishmania in the same way that I described for the 200 genes for the Leishmania kinome. And then we're going to carry out this Leishmania bar seek life cycle phenotyping for all of those mutants. Um, and that should give us a huge data set about genes that are essential for the parasites and the roles that these genes have in Leishmania life cycle progression. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to tag 50% of the protein coding genes in Leishmania in order to identify their location in the, um, in the, in the genome, or in the, sorry, in the, in the parasite. And so this big project, the data will be released onto LeashGem um, as it's developed. It, it started a few weeks ago. Um, so over the next five years, there'll be a large amount of data coming out that people will be able to access and then to use. So I'd just like to finish there um, by um, thanking the audience for their attention. Um, and I'll be able to take questions. But first, I'd just like to thank the people that developed this CRISPR gene editing project within the lab, Nicola Baker and Carol Catapreta, both of whom developed the Leishmania kinome gene deletion, and then other people in the lab who've been um, heavily involved in developing and exploiting this technology. And then, and then Giuliana Carnielli, um, who's a, um, a postdoc funded by the MTD network, who's been developing the precision editing genome and, and, and did all the experiments um, with the analog sensitive mutants. And I'd just like to, to thank the partners who are working with me on this project from the MTD network, companies involved, 
Um, and then also the funding agencies, uh, the Wellcome Trust and UK. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Jeremy, uh, for such an informative and exciting lecture. Now the floor is open for the question and answer session. Can we open the chat box? Uh, there's a lot on the chat and I can't really see questions. Yeah, so if anyone has question, you may ask directly. Please. Okay, there is one uh, from Faryal Ashraf that I know that CRISPR uh, case is very advanced technique, which brought dramatic changes in molecular biology, but I would like to know if you briefly tell us uh, how site-directed mutagenesis is different from CRISPR case. So that's a, that's a good question. Um, so when I when I think about site directed mutagenesis, I tend to think about introducing point mutations into, for example, a plasmid that would then be introduced into the parasite. Um, what we're doing um, with Leishmania is to use CRISPR to do precision editing, which I would say is the equivalent of site directed mutagenesis, but in the parasite genome itself. So it, it is site-directed mutagenesis. Uh, we just call it precision editing because we're referring um, to editing of the genome rather than using it in the standard molecular biology context of making um, site-directed mutants in, in the plasma. Okay, thank you, sir. Now there is another one. Um, how many of the 8,000 genes do you predict will be essential? Well, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, um, so we can we can get some indication from experiments that have been done in other organisms. So, for example, um, an RNAi screen of the whole genome of of the closely related Trypanosoma brucei led to around I think it was twenty two uh, percent of genes were essential. And so I would predict that there would be around 25% of the genome that we, where we will not be able to generate gene deletion mutants in the pro-mastigote stage. So I should say that this is pro-mastigote forms that we're doing the, the genome editing in. And then after we've generated the knockout mutants in pro-mastigotes, we assess their ability to transition through the life cycle. It may be that there are some genes that are essential in pro-mastigotes, but not essential in amastigotes. And so we may try and test that by doing gene deletion directly in amastigotes. So overall, I, within the kinome, it was around 25% of genes that were essential. And I would, I would make a prediction that, we, that it would be around 25%. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And um, there is another uh, question. Can we use this CRISPR technique as a treatment in cancer by inhibiting or removing or cutting the cancer-causing mutated gene? Um, well, there's certainly a lot of interest in using CRISPR um, and gene editing um, in the context of uh, human disease. Um, I know there is, there's interest in genetically manipulating um, cancer cells, but I'm not sure about how practical it would be as a direct therapy. Um, oh. Certainly it can be used, for example, to try and um, edit genomes for a um, for variety of genetic inherited diseases. And that's certainly being looked at. Um, I think cancer will be more challenging. 
Okay, sir. Uh, I see a couple of uh, more questions. Uh, like um, uh, with Cas9, we saw mutation that causes susceptibility in the parasite. How that could be achieved with a drug? Um, so, of course, when when one treats with a drug, there's always the opportunity for the parasites to develop drug resistance. And so there will be mutations that occur in the parasites. Um, and I mean, our, our experience of, of the equivalent experiments with CRISPR-Cas9 is that we don't see many off-target mutational effects in, in the genome. So Leishmania um, is a parasite that accumulates mutations such as single nucleotide polymorphisms as it grows in culture. And so distinguishing between um, CRISPR-Cas9 induced mutations and random mutations is, is quite difficult. Um, so the best way that we can test whether there are any off-target effects for CRISPR genome editing is by having independent mutants that have the same phenotype, and we can test independent clonal mutants for that reason. So, I mean, your lecture is hugely popular. You know, there's so many uh, questions, and I don't know how long you can uh, you would like to spend on responding to them. So it's up to you. Uh, we can see about three more questions here. Uh, I'm happy to take a few more questions. Okay. It's no problem at all. Would you? Shall, yeah. I, shall we take two or three more questions? Sure, please. Yes, sir. Um, so quickly, I'll read them for you. CRISPR-Cas9 uh, became uh, one of the platform for gene sequencing. Is it not? Um, sorry, I missed that. Okay, Upakarna uh, Shamshad. I'll repeat it for you, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. CRISPR-Cas9 became one of the platform for gene sequencing, is it not? It's, uh... um, I'm, I'm not aware of CRISPR being used for, for gene sequencing. Um, okay. That may be a technology I've missed, uh, certainly not something that we're using in, in the lab. We are doing quite a lot of gene sequencing, and so we, we routinely sequence the, the knockout mutants in order to confirm the gene deletion, but we tend to use either Illumina gene sequencing or Nanopore in order to be able to generate the whole genome sequence of Leishmania. Um, but we do that fairly routinely now for our knockout mutants. Now, we're actually not planning to do that for the whole genome knockout. It would be too many, too many um, gene sequences to deal with. Okay, sir. Uh, okay, uh, in the future project, the L OPIT DC approach uh, you're, uh, you're going to use for spatial mapping for protein in Lishmania. How do you intend to look for spatial localization of protein uh, in the amacigoric stage, considering its small size morphology combined with further validation using microscopy? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so just to explain the LOPIT DC technology is a, is, a, is a spatial proteomics approach that's used to identify the by mass spectrometry, the position of a protein within the cell. Um, and so we're using that as an orthogonal approach to confirm localization through the fluorescent um, imaging microscopy that we're doing as well. Um, I agree that Leishmania are small cells, but there's good precedent for using LOPIT to identify different subcellular compartments within the cell. And this has been done for toxoplasma, and it's also been done for, for plasmodium, and also actually for trypanosoma. So we're expecting there to be, for us to be able to distinguish the, the subcellular location of proteins using this approach. The other thing I might add is that we're also interested in, in looking at the subcellular location of proteins in an infected macrophage. So one might predict that some of the proteins from Leishmania are released into the macrophage. Um, and so if we do spatial proteomics of infected Leishmania macrophages, 
we may be able to identify leishmania proteins that are found in subcellular compartments in the macrophage. And that would be a very interesting experiment to try and understand virulence of virulence factors of leishmania and how they operate. Thank you, sir. And I see many other questions, but in the interest of time, I would like to thank you so much. And I would like to give uh, the forum to Professor Iqbal for final comment. So may, uh, I think certainly one of the most popular presentations uh, in last uh, one and a half year during the COVID-19. So I can, I can see about 200 people logged in and all were there all the time. And that reflects the quality of science you're conducting and the way you present it. So I, I was always an admirer. And now you have in, a, in your list of fans, you have another 200 people added. So thank you very much and uh, greatly appreciate your sparing time. And I'm sure that your presentation would trigger a lot of interest in this field. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you very much for inviting me. And, and it will be great to follow up in, in, in future months and years, um, opportunities for interaction between the, the networks and, and Comstex. So I'm delighted to, to be able to talk to people about that in the future. Thank you very much again. For Thank you attention. very much. Thank you.